under Milkwood. To begin at the beginning. It is spring, moonless night in the small town, starless and Bible black. The cobbled street silent, and the hunched quarters and rabbits wood limping invisible down the slow black, slow black, crow black, fishing boat bobbing sea. The houses are blind as moles, though moles see fine tonight in the snouting velvet dingles, or blind as Captain Cat, there in the muffled middle by the pump and the town clock. The shops in mourning, the welfare hall in widow's weeds, and all the people of the lulled and dumbfound town are sleeping now. Hush, the babies are sleeping, the farmers, the fishers, the tradesmen and pensioners, cobbler, school teacher, postman and publican, the undertaker and the fancy woman, dressmaker, drunkard, preacher, policeman, the web foot cockle women, and the tidy wives. Young girls lie bedded soft or glide in their dreams with rings and trousseaus, brides maided by glowworms down the aisles of the organ play wood. The boys are dreaming wicked or of the bucking ranches of the night and the jolly rugged sea. And the anthracite statues of horses sleep in the fields. And the cows in the byres and the dogs in the wet-nosed yards. And the cats nap in slant corners who lopes lie streaking and needling on the one cloud of the roofs. You can hear the dew falling and the hushed town breathing. Only your eyes are unclosed to see the black and folded town fast and slow asleep. And you alone can hear the invisible star fall the darkest before dawn, minutely dew-grey stir of the black, damp-filled sea, where the Arethusa, the Curlew, the Skylark, the Rhiannon, the Rover, the Cormorant, and the Star of Wales tilt and ride. Listen, it is night moving in the streets. It is the slow, salt, musical wind in Coronation Street and Cockle Road. It is the grass growing on Claregib Hill, dewfall, starfall, the sleep of birds in milkwood. Listen, it is night in the chill squat chapel, hymning in bonnet and brooch and bombazine black, butterfly choker and bootless bow, coughing like nanny goats, sucking mintos, forty winking, hallelujah. Night in the four ale, as quiet as a domino, in Oki Milkman's loft, like a mouse with gloves, in Diebred's bakery, flying like black flower. It is tonight in Donkey Street, trotting silent with seaweed on its hooves, along cockle cobbles, past curtained fern pot text and trinket, harmonium, watercolour done by hand, china dog, and the rosy tin tea caddy. It is night, nidding amongst the snuggeries of babies. Look, it is night, dumbly, royally, winding through the coronation cherry trees and going through the graveyard of Bethesda with winds gloved and folded and dewed out, tumbling past the sailor's arm. Time passes. Listen. Time passes. Come closer now. Only you can see the houses sleeping in the streets, in the slow, deep, salt and silent black bandage night. 
Only you can see in the blinded bedrooms, the combs, the petticoats over the chairs, the jugs and basins, the glasses of teeth. Thou shalt not on the wall, and the yellowing dicky bird watching pictures of the dead. Only you can see and hear, behind the eyes of the sleepers, the movements and countries and mazes and colours and dismays and rainbows and tunes and wishes and flights and fall and despairs and the big seas of their dreams. From where you are, you can hear their dreams. Captain Cat. The retired blind sea captain, asleep in his bunk in the seashelled, ship in bottled, ship shaped best cabin of Schooner House, dreams of. From where you are, you can hear in Cockle Row in the spring, moonless night, Miss Price, dressmaker and sweet shopkeeper, dream of. Come now, drift up the dark, come up the drifting sea dark street now in the dark night. Seesawing like the sea, to the Bible black, airless attic, over Jack Black the cobbler's shop, where alone and savagely Jack Black sleeps in a nightshirt tied to his ankles with elastic, and dreams of. And in the little pink eyed cottage next to the undertaker's, lie alone the seventeen snoring gentle stone of Mr. Waldo, rabbit catcher, barber. Herbalist, cat doctor, quack, his fat pink hands, palms up over the edge of the patchwork quilt, his black boots neat and tidy in the washing basin, his bowler on a nail above the bed, a milk stout and a slice of cold bread pudding under the pillow, and dripping in the dark he dreams of. Now, in her iceberg white, holy laundered crinoline nightgown, under virtuous polar sheets, in her spruced and scoured, dust-defying bedroom, in trig and trim bayview, a house for paying guests at the top of the town. Mrs. Ogmore Pritchard, widow twice of Mr. Ogmore, linoleum, retired, and Mr. Pritchard, failed bookmaker, who maddened by presuming, swabbing and scrubbing, the voice of the vacuum cleaner and the fume of polish, ironically swallowed disinfectant, fidgets in her rinsed sleep, wakes in a dream, and nudges in the ribs, dead Mr. Ogmore, dead Mr. Pritchard, ghostly on either hand. At the sea end of town, Mr. and Mrs. Floyd, the cocklers, are sleeping quiet as death, side by wrinkled side, toothless, soaked and brown, like two old kippers in a box. And high above, in Salt Lake Farm, Mr. Utah Watkins counts all night the wife-faced sheep as they leap the fences on the hill, smiling and knitting and bleating, just like Mrs. Utah Watkins. Oki Milkman, drowned asleep in Cockle Street, is emptying his churns in the Dewey River and weeping like a funeral. P.C. Attila Reese lumps out of bed, dead to the dark and still fog-horning, and drags his helmet out from under the bed, but deep in the backyard lock-up of his sleep, a mean voice murmurs, You'll be sorry for this in the morning, and he heave hose back to bed, his helmet squashes in the dark. Sinbad sailors, over the tap-room of the sailor's arms, hugs his damp pillow, whose secret name is Gossamer Bynum. A mogul catches Lily Smalls in the wash house. Alone until she dies. Bessie Bighead, hired help, born in the workhouse, smelling of the cowshed, snores bass and gruff on a couch of straw in a loft in Salt Lake Farm, and picks a posy of daisies in Sunday Meadow to put on the grave of Goma Owen who kissed her once by the pigsty when she wasn't looking, and never kissed her again, although she was looking all the time. And the inspectors of cruelty fly down into Mrs. Butcher Biner's dream to persecute Mr. Biner for selling... Now, now, behind the eyes and secrets 
of the dreamers in the streets rocked to sleep by the sea. See the... The owls are hunting. Look over Bethesda gravestone. One hoots and swoops and catches a mouse by Hannah Ree's beloved wife. And in Coronation Street, which you alone can see, it is so dark under the chapel in the skies. The Reverend Eli Jenkins, poet, preacher, turns in his deep towards dawn sleep and dreams of Mr. Pugh, schoolmaster, fathoms the sleep, pretends to be sleeping, spies Foxy around the droop of his nightcap, whist, whistles up. Mrs. Organ Morgan, groceress, coiled grey like a dormouse, her paws to her ears conjures. Mary Ann Sailors dreams of In Donkey Street, so furred with sleep, Dibred, Polygata, No Good Boyo, and Lord Cutglass sigh before the dawn that is about to be, and dream of Time passes. Listen. Time passes. An owl flies home past Bethesda to a chapel in an oak. And the dawn inches up. Stand on this hill. This is La Regev Hill. Old as the hills, high, cool and green. And from this small circle of stones, made not by druids, but by Mrs. Bynan's Billy, you can see all the town below you sleeping in the first of the dawn. You can hear the love-sick wood pigeons mooning in bed. A dog barks in his sleep, farmyards away. The town ripples like a lake in a waking haze. The principality of the sky lightens now over our green hill into spring morning larked and crowed and belling. Who pulls the town hall bell rope but blind Captain Cat? One by one the sleepers are rung out to sleep this one morning as every morning. And soon you shall see the chimneys slow up flying snow as Captain Cat in sailor's cap and sea boots announces today with his loud get out of bed bell. Now, woken at last, by the out of bed, sleepy head, Polly put the kettle on, town hall bell, Lily Smalls, Mrs. Bynan's treasure, comes downstairs from a dream of royalty, who all night long went larking with her, full of sauce in the milk wood dark, and puts the kettle on the primus stove in Mrs. Bynan's kitchen, and looks at herself in Mr. Bynan's shaving glass over the sink, and sees, and very softly, her lips almost touching her reflection, she breathes the name and clouds the shaving glass. Mr. Pew, in the schoolhouse opposite, takes up the morning tea to Mrs. Pew and whispers on the stairs. Organ Morgan, at his bedroom window, playing chords on the sill to the morning fishwife gulls, who heckling over Donkey Street observe now, frying pans spit, kettles and cats purr in the kitchen. The town smells of seaweed and breakfast all the way down from Bayview, where Mrs. Ogmore Pritchard, in smock and turban, big bism to engage the dust, picks at her starstless bread and sips lemon rind tea. To Bottom Cottage, where Mr. Waldo, in bowler and bib, gobbles his bubble and squeak and skippers and swigs from the sauce bottle. Mary Ann Sailors. Mr. and Mrs. Cherry Owen, in their Donkey Street room that is bedroom, parlour, kitchen and scullery, sit down to last night's supper of onions boiled in their overcoats and broth of spuds and bacon rind and leeks and bones. 
From Butcher Bynum's in Coronation Street, the smell of fried liver sidles out with onions on its breath. And listen. In the dark breakfast room behind the shop, Mr. and Mrs. Bynum, waited upon by their treasure, enjoy between bites their every morning hullabaloo. And Mrs. Bynum slips the grisly bits under the tasseled tablecloth to her fat cat. Up the street, in the sailor's arms, Sinbad Sailors, grandson of Mary Ann Sailors, draws a pint in the sunlit bar. The ship's clock in the bar says half past eleven. Half past eleven is opening time. The hands of the clock have stayed still at half past eleven for fifty years. It is always opening time in the sailor's arms. All over the town, babies and old men are cleaned and put into their broken prams and wheeled out onto the sunlit cockle cobbles or out into the backyards under the dancing underclothes and left. A baby cries. Noses are wiped, heads picked, hair combed, paws scrubbed, ears boxed, and the children shrilled off to school. He turns his head and looks up at La Regueville and sees amongst green lathered trees the white houses of the strewn away farms where farm boys whistle, dogs shout, cows low, but all too far away for him or you to hear. And in the town the shops squeak open. Mr. Edwards, in butterfly collar and straw hat, at the doorway of Manchester House, measures with his eye the dawdlers by for striped flannel shirts and shrouds and flowery blouses, and bellows to himself in the darkness behind his eye. Syrup is sold in the post office. A car drives to market full of fowls and a farmer. Milk churns stand at Coronation Corner like short silver policemen. And sitting in the open window of Schooner House, blind Captain Cat hears all the mourning of the town. There's the clip-clop of horses on the sun-honeyed cobbles of the humming streets, hammering of horseshoes, gobble, quack and cackle, tom-tit twitter from the bird ounce boughs, braying on donkey down. Bread is baking, pigs are grunting, chop goes the butcher, milk churns bell, tills ring, sheep cough, dogs shout, saws sing. Oh, the spring whinny and morning moo from the clog dancing farms, the gulls gab and ravel on the boat bobbing river and sea, and the cockles bubbling in the sand, scamper of sandlings, curlews cry, crows caw, pigeon coo, clock strike, bull bellow, and the ragged gabble of the bear garden school, as the women scratch and babble in Mrs. Organ Morgan's general shop where everything is sold, custard, buckets, henna, rat traps, shrimp nets, sugar, stamps, confetti, paraffin, hatchets, whistles. Outside the sun springs down on the rough and tumbling town. It runs through the hedges of Guzgog Lane, cuffing the birds to sing. Spring whips green down Cockle Row, and the shells ring out. La Regib, this snip of a morning is wild fruit and warm. The streets, fields, sands, and waters springing in the young sun. And in willy-nilly the postman's dark and sizzling damp, tea-coated, misty pygmy kitchen, where the spitting cat kettles throb and hop on the range, Mrs. Willy Nilly steams open Mr. Mog Edwards' letter to Miss McFanry Price and reads it aloud to Willy Nilly by the squint of the spring sun through the one sealed window running with tears, while the drugged, bedraggled hens at the back door whimper and sniffle for the licorice bog black tea. And Willy Nilly, rumbling, jockeys out again to the three seated shack called the House of Commons in the back, where the hens weep and sees in sudden spring shine. Children spank and scamper rough and singing out of school into the draggle tail yard, and Captain Cat at his window says softly to himself the words of their song. The music of the spheres is heard distinctly over Milkwood. It is the rustle of spring. 
Vegetables make love above the tenors. Mrs. Ogmore Pritchard belches in a teeny hanky and chases the sunlight with a fly whisk, but even she cannot drive out the spring. From one of the finger bowls a primrose grows. The morning is all singing. The Reverend Eli Jenkins, busy on his morning calls, stops outside the welfare hall to hear Polly Garter as she scrubs the floor for the Mother's Union dance tonight. The town's as full as a lovebird's egg. And Mr Waldo, who is thinking of a woman soft as Eve and sharp as Sayateka to share his bread-pudding bed, answers, and the morning school is over, and Captain Cat at his curtain schooner's porthole, open to the spring sun tides, hears the naughty forfeiting children tumble and rhyme on the cobbles. And the shrill girls giggle and muster around him, and squeal as they clutch and thrash, and he blubbers away downhill with his patch pants falling, and his tears splash blush burns all the way as the triumphant bird-like sisters scream with buttons in their claws, and the bully brothers hoot after him, his little nickname and his mother's shame, and his father's wickedness with the loose, wild, barefoot women of the hovels of the hills. It all means nothing at all and howling for his milky mum for her cowl and buttermilk and cow breath and Welsh cakes and the fat birth-smelling bed and moonlit kitchen of her arms, he'll never forget as he paddles blind home through the weeping end of the world. Then his tormentors tussle and run to the Cockle Street sweet shop with pennies sticky as honey to buy from Miss McFanley Price, who is cocky and neat as a puff bosom robin, and her small round buttocks tight as ticks, gobstoppers big as wens that rainbow as you suck, brandy balls, wine gums, hundreds and thousands, licorice sweet to stick, nougat to tug and ribbon out like another red rubbery tongue, gum to glue in girls' curls, crimson cough drops to spit blood, ice cream cornets, dandelion and burdock, raspberry and cherryade, pop goes the weasel and the wind. In the blind-drawn, dark dining room of schoolhouse, dusty and echoing as the dining room in a vault, Mr. and Mrs. Pugh are silent over cold, grey cottage pie. Mr. Pugh reads as he forks the shroud meat in from Lives of the Great Poisonous. He has bound a plain brown paper cover round the book, slyly between slow mouthfuls his side spies up at Mrs. Pugh, poisons her with his eye, and then goes on reading. He underlines certain passages and smiles in secret. Says Mrs. Pugh, as she swallows a digestive tablet as big as a horse bill, washing it down with clouded pea soup water. Alone in the hissing laboratory of his wishes, Mr. Pugh minces amongst bad vats and jeroboams, tiptoes through spinnies of murdering herbs, agony dancing in his crucibles, and mixes, especially for Mrs. Pugh, a venomous porridge unknown to toxicologists, which will scold and viper through her until her ears fall off like figs, her toes grow big and black as balloons, and steam comes screaming out of her navel. Lord Cutglass, in his kitchen full of time, squats down alone to a dogfish marked Fido of peppery fish scraps and listens to the voices of his sixty-six clocks, one for each year of his loony age, and watches with love their black and white moony loud-lipped faces talking the earth away. Slow clocks, quick clocks, Pendulum heart knocks, China, alarm, grandfather, cuckoo, clocks shaped like Noah's whirring ark, clocks that bicker in marble ships, clocks in the wombs of glass women, hourglass timers, to it to woo clocks, clocks that pluck tunes, Vesuvius clocks, old black bells and lava, Niagara clocks that cataract their ticks, old time weeping clocks with ebony beards, clocks with no hands forever drumming out time without ever knowing what time it is. 
His sixty-six singers are all set at different hours. Lord Cutglass lives in a house in a life at siege. Any minute or dark day now, an unknown enemy will loot and savage downhill, but they will not catch him napping. Sixty-six different times in his fish-slimy kitchen, ping, strike, tick, chime, and talk. The sunny, slow, lulling afternoon yawns and moons through the dozy town. The sea lulls, laps, and idles him, with fishes sleeping in its lap. The meadows still as Sunday, the shut-eye tassel bulls, the goat and daisy dingles nap, happy and lazy. The dumb duck pond snooze. Clouds sag and pillow on Laragib Hill. Pigs grunt in a wet wallow bath and smile as they snort and dream. They dream of the acorn swill of the world, the rooting for pig fruit, the bagpipe dugs of the mother sow, the squeal and snuffle of yeses of the women pigs in rut. They mud bask and snout in the pig loving sun. Their tails curl, they rollick and slobber and snore to deep, smug, after swill sleep. Donkeys angelically drowse on donkey down. Mr. Pew cringes awake. He puts on a soft, soaping smile. It is sad and grey under his nicotine, egg-yellow, weeping, walrus, Victorian moustache, worn thick and long in memory of Dr. Crippen. Captain Cat, at his window thrown open wide to the sun and the clippered seas, he sailed long ago when his eyes were blue and bright. Slumbers and voyages, earringed and rolling. I love you, rosy Probert, Tattooed on his belly, he brawls with broken bottles in the fog and babel of the dark dock bars, roves with a herd of short and good-time cows in every naughty port, and twines and souses with the drowned and blousy-breasted dead. He weeps as he sleeps and sails. She shakes her brass nightgown, and he chases her out of his mind. But when he comes gusting back, there in the bloodshot centre of his eye, a geisha girl grins and bows in a kimono of rice paper. He sighs as she rides politely. The land fades, the sea flocks silently away, and through the warm white cloud where he lies, silky, tingling, uneasy, eastern music undoes him in a Japanese minute. The Reverend Eli Jenkins, inky in his cool front parlour or poem room, tells only the truth in his life work. The population, main industry, shipping, history, topography, flora and fauna of the town he worships in. The White Book of Laregib. Portraits of famous bards and preachers, all fur and wool from the squint to the kneecaps, hang over him heavy as sheep. Next to faint Lady watercolours of pale green milkwood, like a lettuce salad, dying. His mother, propped against a pot in a palm, with her wedding ring waist and bust like a black clothed dining table, suffers in her stays. There is no known likeness of his father Esau, who, undog collared because of his little weakness, was scythed to the bone one harvest by mistake when sleeping with his weakness in the corn. He lost all ambition and died with one leg. Look up, Bessie Bighead, in the white book of Laregum, and you will find the few haggard rags and one poor glittering thread of her history laid out there with as much love and care as the lock of hair of a first lost love. Conceived in milkwood, Born in a barn, wrapped in paper, left on a doorstep, 
big-headed and based voice, she grew in the dark, until long dead Goma Owen kissed her when she wasn't looking because he was dead. Now in the light she'll work, sing, milk, say the cow's sweet names, and sleep until the night sucks out her soul and spits it into the sky. In her lifelong low light, holy Bessie milks the fond lake-eyed cows as dust showers slowly down over byre, sea, and town. Utah Watkins curses through the farmyard on a cart, cart horse, and the huge horse neighs softly as though he'd given it a lump of sugar. Now the town is dusk. Each cobble, donkey, goose, and gooseberry street is a thoroughfare of dusk, and dusk and ceremonial dust, and night's first darkening snow, and the sleep of birds drift under and through the live dusk of this place of love. La Regan is the capital of dusk. Mrs. Ogmore Pritchard, as the first drop of dusk shower, seals all her sea view doors, draws the germ-free blinds, sits erect as a dry dream on a high-backed hygienic chair, and wills herself to cold, quick sleep. At once, at twice, Mr. Armour and Mr. Pritchard, who all dead day long have been gossiping like ghosts in the woodshed, planning the loveless destruction of their glass widow, reluctantly sigh and sidle into her clean house. And in through the keyhole, with tears where their eyes once were, they ooze and grumble. She says in her sleep, there is acid love in her voice for one of the two shambling phantoms. Mr. Ogmore hopes that it is not for him. So does Mr. Pritchard. At the doorway of Bethesda House, the Reverend Eli Jenkins recites to Laregeb his sunset poem. Jack Black prepares once more to meet his Satan in the woods. He grinds his night teeth, closes his eyes, climbs into his religious trousers, their flies sewn up with cobbler's thread, and pads out, torched and bibled, grimly, joyfully, into the already sinning dusk. And Cherry Owen, sober as Sunday, as he is every day of the week, goes off happy as Saturday to get drunk as a deacon, as he does every night. Dusk is drowned for ever until tomorrow. It is all at once night now. The windy town is a hill of windows, and from the larruped waves the lights of the lamps in the windows call back the day and the dead that have run away to sea. All over the calling dark, babies and old men are bribed and lullabied to sleep. Or their daughters cover up the old, unwinking men like parrots, and in their little dark, in the lit and bustling young kitchen corners, all night long they watch, beady-eyed, the long night through, in case death catches them asleep. The drinkers in the sailors' arms drink to the failure of the dance. Righteously, says Cherry Owen, who has just down seventeen pints of flat, warm, thin, Welsh bitter beer. La Regim Hill, writes the Reverend Eli Jenkins in his poem room. Blind Captain Cat climbs into his bunk. Like a cat, he sees in the dark. Through the voyages of his tears, he sails to see the dead. The dead come out in their Sunday best. Organ Morgan goes to chapel to play the organ. He sees Bach lying on a tombstone. Says Cherry Owen, who is resting on the tombstone on his way home. Mr. Mog Edwards and Miss McFanley Price, happily apart from one another at the top and sea end of the town, 
write their every night letters of love and desire. In the warm white book of Larigib, you will find the little maps of the islands of their contentment. And she looks around with pleasure at her own neat, never dull room, which Mr. Mog Edwards will never enter. And he hugs his lovely money to his own heart. And Mr. Waldo, drunk in the dusky wood, hugs his lovely Polly Garter under the eyes and rattling tongues of the neighbours and the birds, and he does not care. He smacks his live red lips. But it is not his name that Polly Garter whispers as she lies under the oak and loves him back. Six feet deep, that name sings in the cold earth. The thin night darkens. A breeze from the creased water sighs the streets close under milk waking wood. The wood whose every tree's foot's cloven in the black glad sight of the hunters of lovers. That is a God-built garden to Marianne's sailors who knows there is heaven on earth and the chosen people of his kind fire in the Regib's land. That is the fair day, farmhands wantoning, ignorant chapel of bridesmaids. And to the Reverend Eli Jenkins, a green leaf sermon on the innocence of men. The suddenly wind shaken wood springs awake for a second dark time this one spring day.